Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to the webinar Managing Product Managers by Spotify Senior Product Manager, Tiag Fernandes. Uh, you can contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter, following the links below. But first, let me tell you a bit more about myself. So I'm a Senior Product Manager at Spotify, but uh, as you can imagine, I'm an individual contributor now. So what do I know about management? But Previously, I was working at Farfetch, luxury fashion e-commerce marketplace. And for the last three years of my tenure there, I was actually a people manager where I learned a lot about managing product managers. I'm from Portugal, but currently based in London. And for hobbies, I'm very passionate about CrossFit, reading books, especially psychology and management books. And with the lockdown, I picked up a new hobby in the past couple of months, gardening, and maybe my next webinar will be about that. But let's see. So the agenda for today, I'm going, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the mind, mindset shift that needs to operate when you transition into being a people manager, the, the importance and how to create a better actual feedback culture, success of the team and then I'll share some useful links for for the, the people that want to learn more about managing product managers. The, the management lessons that we had was that first, he just assumes what the person needs. He doesn't want to hear, he, he, he sort of knows instinctively what the person on his team wants to, to talk about. Then he flexes his hierarchical muscles. He has a talk manager, a manager. Then he just executes. He doesn't wait for the person on his team to do the work. He just goes and does it. And lastly, it diminishes how hard something is. He, he makes it look very easy. Now, as you might be figuring out already, all of this is just plain wrong. So. But however, there are some, some lessons, a lot of lessons actually to be taken from Michael Scott. What are those lessons? Now let's see all of these things that he, how he could have done them differently. Now, first he could have started by listening intently to the person that was talking with him. Then he could be mentoring and coaching the, the, the person. He could provide space for the, the team member of his team to make mistakes and grow with them. And then it, it should be acknowledging background and context. Now let's dive a little deeper into each of these separately about listening intently. When, when you are listening to someone, you really need to be focusing fully in the person that you are speaking speaking with. You need to give them your full attention. And it's crucial that you do not interrupt other people to, to, to make the other person feel comfortable speaking to you, to show to them that you are not uh, distracted. Don't interrupt them vocally or even worse with your thoughts. Because if you are interrupting the person with your thoughts, are you really listening? Be aware as well of your body language. And even though we're living in this very remote, friendly environment, body language is not as important, but it is still important. Try to make eye contact with, with the person that you are speaking with. Try not to be distracted with your cell phone, other applications or messages that you are receiving with people passing by. Giving someone your full attention is not only a mental exercise, it is a full body exercise. And lastly, don't just jump in and start speaking. Take time to absorb what you've just heard. Try to understand what that means and reflect before actually speaking. Now, mentoring, and it's important to mention there's a, a, a usual pitfall in, in leading by example what is actually means. Leading by example example is not often doing the work instead of the person. You should see leading by example as doing the work with the person, as pointing the direction, as showing uh, in, in, a, in a way that allows the person to understand and to learn from that 
don't get to work done, make sure that there is a lesson to, to be taken from that. Also, try to focus on asking more questions and providing less answers. There's a book that I mentioned at the end in useful contact content called Coaching Habit that mentions that a lot. When you are providing the answers, you, 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 are, you are just giving the, the, the person something to go, but they won't really understand why they, they're doing things that way. Now, I attended um, a, a coaching training some months ago, and one, one of the, the exercises that we did was trying to ask questions to, to the, the other person that was with us and make, and never asking leading questions, just making broad questions that made the person think about what the, what the actual problem was and helping them get to a solution without leading them to a solution. So uh, an example of a leading question is, have you tried this approach? This is a leading question. You're just giving an answer, but formulating that as a question. So that's a bad question to be asked. Now, if you ask, so why did you try this approach? What's the advantage? And when the person answers, you could do a follow-up question. Now, what other approaches are there? And you can continue doing this until you enable the person to get to the answers themselves. Now, something that's extremely important to be mindful of is that you are dealing with people, not robots, right? And even when you're just nowadays uh, having remote calls or even messages in Slack or emails, it is always people that you are talking with, people with emotions. So be mindful of those emotions, be mindful of how they affect the people you are talking with and acknowledge them. And lastly, take every opportunity to provide feedback. I'm going to talk more about this in the next session, but this is crucial that you take every opportunity that you can to provide feedback to the person, to the people you are working with. Now about providing space for mistakes. If, if you go back and think a bit about the biggest lessons you have learned in your life, those will, pro the, the longer lasting in the memory at least, will probably be tied to, to some mistakes that you made. Mistakes, failing is crucial in ensuring that people learn and grow. One of the f best feedbacks in the end of your review cycles I've received was fail more, fail better. And that has kept to me up to this day. And I still remember that feedback vividly. Your role as a people manager isn't to prevent mistakes from your team. It is to ensure that your team learns from those mistakes and takes valuable lessons for growth from those mistakes that they will make. Everyone makes them. Now, you can do this by being hands off from the work that needs to be done by your team, but being very hands-on on ensuring that your team has everything that they need to perform their best work. They don't have any blockers. They have um, the, the, all the conditions that they need to be set up for success. And uh, you can to do that, you need to cast a safety, net, a safety net for your team. Obviously, you shouldn't be allowing your team to make career-breaking mistakes, like sharing objectively false information, but you, you need to let them make small mistakes, make some wrong decisions that do no harm. And that's the safety net. It's just trying to understand where, where's the tipping point and how to find that balance. And acknowledging the background and context of people is extremely important. Context is one of the most important decisions in, in elements in decision making. Now, if, if you have never watched The Office, Michael Scott has been at the same company for 12 years, four of them as a manager. Can you imagine the, the difference, the gap in context he has from a person that has just joined the company? It's, it's huge. And we can assume that that person will take at least 12 years to, to reach the same level. Of, of context and historical context and background and the understanding dynamics and how everything works. So acknowledge that 
and, and understand that each element in your team will have a different context and a different background. Now, use all of the steps that I mentioned before, especially listening intently, to, to understand what are these differences in context. Where, where is some member of your team lacking some specific context that they need to have for that particular decision-making process, for example? Also, be very mindful of how different backgrounds play a role in dynamics. If you have a product manager in your team that has a technical background, you'll probably be much more comfortable working with engineering peers, whereas someone that doesn't have a technical background might like some context there. And you need to acknowledge for those and you need to tailor uh, growth and learning experiences to be specific to each person's background and context. Now, if you only have time to do one thing with your team, now, f first I would question if your priorities are set right, but in the case that you only have time to do one thing with, with your team, provide context. That's, that's the best long-term investment you can do for your team. So the key takeaways from this first chapter, you need to change your mindset. You are no longer an individual contributor and now your team is your product. And the key words are leadership and mentoring. Feedback yeah. is hard. Feedback is very hard. And it's hard to give feedback, but it's also hard to receive feedback. Now, what can we do to, to make that easier? Now, we, we should start by creating a safe space. It's also important to provide immediate feedback to, um, to, to your team whenever you have the chance. Have a structure, 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 and practice receiving feedback from your team. To create a safe space with your team, first, you need to start caring personally about the, the person. Kim Scott mentions that in her book, Radical Candor, and it's extremely important that you care personally. Don't just talk about work, but also don't, don't do small talk like about the weather. Truly care about how the person feels and what's happening in her life. Also, build, build rapport. Try to understand what, what motivates a person professionally and personally as well. Don't judge it's not your role it's not your place to be judging others just be judgment free and listen listen to what the person in your team has to share when they talk with you and be open talk about yourself share what motivates you share what's going on in your personal life what what your hobbies and interests are when we look back into this chapter all of these points they they aren't management specific they are actually about creating meaningful relationships with other people. And that's what creating a safe space is about. Create meaningful, meaningful relationships with the people in your team. Now, immediate feedback is crucial. It, there are all of these uh, periods to provide formal feedback. Most companies do a, a check-in at the middle of the year and then at the end of the year. Now, when I'm receiving feedback from six months ago, it's hard to place it. So don't wait. When you have feedback to provide, be it constructive or positive feedback, take the opportunity to, to share that. There are no perfect moments to provide feedback. And a 10 minute chat between meetings when moving from one meeting to the other is more than enough to have a feedback conversation. Also, try to share feedback in person as much as you can. I know that nowadays we don't have much in-person talks, but set up a call and speak with the person. Avoid written feedback via messages or email. It is too impersonal and especially constructive feedback makes you look weak as a manager that you can't face the person and give them, also give them the space to give their side of the feedback and understand it better. Structure is also fundamental in providing feedback. 
because feedback is hard, we already acknowledge that, but having a structure makes it easier for you to provide feedback, but also for the person that is receiving the feedback. If it always comes in the same structure, it gets easier over time to understand the content. To, to have a better structure, to, two of the key elements is first, be very specific about which situation you are referring to. Avoid broad feedbacks uh, like not tying them to a specific situation. If you saw a behavior, a specific behavior in a moment, use that as an example so that the person receiving the feedback can tie the feedback back to the situation where it happened. And also be very clear about why that feedback is important. So when you were doing that presentation to the CEO, you missed to present some relevant data, which should have a better impact in informing the, the decision. That's a better feedback because you're providing the situation and you're saying why it is important. If that helps you, pick a framework that helps you. There are several frameworks. The situation behavior impact model is very common, very used, but you don't need to use that one. Just use a framework that works both for you and for your team. Now, the the most important part of feedback, practice receiving feedback. Now, your role is to provide feedback to your team, to help them grow. And even though it's your role and it's expected of you to do that, it's already hard. Now, imagine how hard it must be for your team to provide you with feedback. It's extremely hard. So acknowledge, state that out loud. I know it's hard for you to provide me with feedback and don't expect them to proactively come back to you with feedback. You, you need to make sure that that cycle, that feedback cycle happens, either by booking time, um, saying that this time is for you to provide me with feedback or even by acknowledging the, how hard it is and creating written anonymous feedbacks for your team to be more comfortable with, but you you ha really have to work to get to get that feedback from your team and to make it easier for the people it is crucial that you do not react to the feedback when you are receiving feedback from someone on your team do not try to justify yourself do not try to find excuses you will just be shutting down the door for future feedbacks don't react you can just Ask a clarifying question like, okay, your feedback in this situation, my behavior was this and this was the impact, just to confirm, but don't do anything else. In case you don't know what to say, just nod. Nothing should be more than enough. And after receiving the feedback and not reacting to it, act on it. Be sure to act on the feedback and go back with what you did, what were your steps and what was the result of that feedback and close the, the feedback cycle loop with your team to show to them how valuable their feedback is to you. Now, the key takeaways from this chapter, feedback is hard, just acknowledge that and the key words are trust and safety. Now, when I said that the management lesson was from Steve, I think you were thinking about the legendary CEO Steve Jobs, but actually it's from Steve Wozniak, who goes above and beyond and faces Steve Jobs just to get selflessly recognition for his team. Now, to make sure that you have a successful team, you need to set up your team to be successful. You need to celebrate achievements just following Steve Wozniak's management lesson and you need to build a team and know a group of people isn't a team. So let's see, let's deep dive into this and see what they actually mean. Setting up the team for success. So if you're a people manager, you will have more access to the strategy. You'll be working more strategically in, in some topics, provide visibility to that strategy and do so by sharing as much context as possible. Do you remember the in, in, on the first chapter when I mentioned context? Well, context is crucial. Make sure that you are sharing as much context as possible. If you only take one thing out of this webinar, may it be this one. 
share as much context as possible with your team. Set the direction, set the direction for your team. If the direction is north, make sure that your team is going north. Your responsibility as a people manager is not only with your people, but with the company and making sure that your team is aligned with the company's goals and strategy. And you should be setting that direction, but giving enough space for your team to decide on how they're going to pursue that direction and be organized. How, how many people relate with having 30 different Google Docs with overlapping and duplicated information? Well, that's not useful. That's a waste of time and that's inefficient. So organization cascades down, such as OKRs. So be sure to be organized and your team will follow. So that's a perfect example of leading by example is being organized. Celebrating achievements is crucial in a healthy team, like the lesson you just saw from Steve Wozniak. So start by encouraging your team members to share their success stories, right? If there is a success story, it needs to be shared with everyone. And also, since you have access to other areas of the organization, naturally because of your role, make sure to share the team's achievements across the organization. And remember, it's the team's achievements, not your achievement, not I, it's us, we as a team. If you don't know really how to share it, just, just say it. Hey, you did a great job. Congratulations. That goes a long way in making your team feel appreciated. And also just a, a small pitfall, be aware of unhealthy competition within the, the team. If you feel that the, it's, it's setting the, the, the stage for people just to, to show off, be aware of that and make sure that the achievements are celebrated in a healthy way, creating the, the stage for everyone to be successful. Now, building a team. All of the previous points are important to building a team, but there are more steps that you can take, especially around diversity and inclusion, which should be very important topics to you. I believe that diversity means representation across a wide range of traits, backgrounds, and experiences. When we can connect and engage with coworkers with different perspectives than our own, we can more successfully achieve our overall goals. Inclusion refers to a sense of belonging in any environment. For a company to really achieve the benefits of diversity, it has to work across the entire company in making sure there's diversity. It, Employees in inclusive workplaces feel more comfortable sharing their unique ideas and perspectives because they can sense that their differences are genuinely, genuinely respected and appreciated. It, it should be very important for you that everyone you work with feels safe, accepted and valued and has an equal opportunity to grow and succeed. Together, the values of diversity and inclusion will help create a workplace culture that drives the business forward. Also, try to create a team where the team members offer support to each other. You shouldn't be asking someone on your team to help another teammate. You want a collaborative, cohesive unit working together to, to achieve the, the results. Also, a, a healthy team communicates well with each other. They don't need a manager creating bridges between them. They will create those bridges. They will be a self-organized unit. And lastly, try to have some fun. People are, when people have fun, they are happier and more efficient and productive in the long term. So the main takeaways from this chapter, if your team isn't successful and you are, you are probably an individual contributor and not really a people manager. Be aware of that. And the keywords are team and selflessness, like the lesson we got from Steve Wozniak. Now, the summary from what we discussed, you need to change your perspective, you need to change your mindset when you become a manager. You are no longer an individual contributor, you are a people manager. You need to create a culture of bidirectional feedback, not only feedback for your team members to allow them to grow, but also feedback for yourself to grow as a manager and learn how to be a better manager. And your team success is ultimately your success. Now, I just 
touch the tip of the, the iceberg with this presentation, but I, I thought of adding some useful content so that you can learn from the, the, the people and content that have inspired me and taught me a lot over the years. Uh, in terms of books, I was very happy and, and grateful and lucky to have read Radical Candor by Kim Scott early in my management career. It's a masterpiece. Also, Julie Zou wrote an excellent book on management. I mentioned already The Coaching Habit by Michael Bungay-Stanier and Andrew Grove's classic High Output Management is an amazing resource as well. In terms of Twitter, these are three key people I follow, not only about management, managing people, but product management in general. If you don't have a Twitter account, just create one to follow these these three guys. The, the, the amount of free content available on these accounts in Twitter is just truly amazing. And then you have some podcasts that you can listen on Spotify, the product podcast by your own product school, coaching for leaders and masters of scale. Now, thank you for tuning in and stay safe.